Okay. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today we present another in our series of Japanophiles, and our guest today is a German Zen Buddhist priest called No Ken Muho, who is the head priest of the temple which lies at the top of this rather imposing looking staircase. And the temple's known as Antaiji. Well, here we go. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> nice to see you. My Finally, pleasure. we made it. It's a, it's a pretty impressive staircase you have coming up here. You made it, obviously. Yes. Well, you, made it. you almost feel like you're halfway to heaven by the time you got to the top of that thing. <laughs> Antaiji, which lies deep in the mountains of Hyogo Prefecture, is a training temple of the Soto sect of Zen Buddhism. It is known for its rigorous practice of Zazen, seated meditation. Noke Muho has been head priest here for nine years. And this is where we meditate each morning and each evening. Roughly how many hours a day would you be doing that? On the average, five hours. Five hours in yeah. two sittings? Then we have the session where we sit 15 hours. And if you calculate that, um, then you get 1,800 hours per year that we sit. Okay. Before they begin their zazen, they must put their hands together in a show of respect to the Buddha and the Hall of Worship. And then you sit down. The next step would be then the left foot on top of the right thigh. Okay, that one may just about go. Yeah, sometimes it's... Okay. People are more flexible on one side <laughs> or the other. Well, um, we have not too well. <laughs> another thing that's, that's not traditional Japanese style in Zen monasteries, but you can also sit like this. Actually, I'll do that because that's going to um, be more comfortable so that's for kind of in the easy. short. Yep. Um, okay. that, that makes it kind of easy to sit. Yep. Okay. And you're breathing with the diaphragm and the breath should get deeper and slower, although you don't force your breath to become deep and slow. The day at Antaiji begins before daybreak. 3.45 a.m. One of the Zen students sounds a wake-up bell. Within 10 minutes everyone is dressed and they've assembled in the main hall. The first task of the day is Zazen. Everyone sits quietly for two hours as dawn slowly breaks. Antaiji receives Zen students not only from Japan, but internationally as well. Each year around 100 people come here eager to work with Muho. Zen is a school of Buddhism practiced mainly in East Asia. It's centered on Zazen, seated meditation. Casting away earthly desires and attachments, the meditator enters a state of nothingness. During the morning meditation, breakfast is prepared in the kitchen. The students take turns at this job. Eating is essential for living, and preparing meals is an important part of Zen practice. Use everything, waste nothing. That is one of Muho's teachings. 
Even potato peel is fried and eaten. At six, it's time for breakfast. Right now, there are six foreign and five Japanese students. Thanks are offered for the food, and sutras are recited. Strict rules are observed during meals. To concentrate on eating, conversation is forbidden. Not even chewing sounds are allowed. There is no moment to relax after the meal. Aside from Zazen, tasks like cleaning and farming are an essential part of the training. Antaiji has no formal source of income and is basically self-sufficient. Every winter, this area is buried in at least two meters of snow. So they have to work hard now to chop enough firewood to last them until spring. Or you can chop it either way, but this might be easier. <laughs> Muho is clearing the land for new rice fields so that he can take in more students. This is part of our training, of course. Everyday life is training. From sitting and meditating to working the land, everything is Zen. So how was that small little sitting for you? Just even after a few minutes, gradually I found my breathing becoming very rhythmical. The, the extremely quiet surroundings here obviously are very beneficial for that, I'm sure, but it's a fantastic experience. I'm a little bit surprised, actually. Um, I think I could actually get to enjoy this. Great, great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The ideal is to open the awareness for all aspects, um, mm -hmm. both of the physical sensations, the visual fields, what you hear, the sounds, the breathing, all of that. I'm yes. sure most people watching this program around the world, if they have any image of Zen, of Zen Buddhism, it's very much of sitting in quiet meditation. And they probably don't think about the other aspects of it. Um, but in fact, you're saying it's just one part of, your de of what you do. Yeah, uh. yeah. I would call the Zen the center, but it's not only the center that's important, but also the... the whole wheel that's turning around that center, turning around the axis. Mm. And in Antaiji, according to the season, the work can, well, sometimes at least feel much harder than the pain in the legs that you experience during the Zen. And in the case of this monastery, that means a lot of hard work. Um, but uh, what makes that practice, religious practice for us, is that we do it 100%. When you eat, you just eat. When you work, you just work. When you do Zazen, you just sit. When you go to the toilet, you just go to the toilet. And that's all. And you try to do that as thoroughly as you can. Olaf Nelke lost his mother when he was seven. At the age of 16, as he was pondering the meaning of life, he learned about Zazen. In 1990, at the age of 22, he enrolled at Kyoto University to study Zen in earnest. While he was in Japan, he visited Antaiji and ended up spending six months training there. Later, he was formally received into the monastery, 
With his new name, Nel K. Muho, his life as a Zen monk began. You were saying that you had already experienced Zazen in Germany. Yes, probably objectively it was the most difficult period in my life. But for the first time, paradoxically, I felt thankful to be alive because it de didn't feel like a matter of course anymore. Before that, I always thought, of course, I'm alive. Uh, my parents gave birth to me, but what meaning is there? Why do I have to live? Mm. I asked myself already a very young age. That has to do with the fact that my mother died when I was seven years old. Oh, I see. During the Zen, for the first time, I had a realization, no, it's not only this brain that's thinking, that's me, but also the lungs breathing, that's me, the heart beating, that's me, the straight spine, that's me. And actually, they determine who I am. Did you have any ideas in your mind of what to expect who came to Japan? Actually, also my first experience with Japan, there was, uh, I did a homestay, um, but also, funnily, it was a Christian family. There's not so many Christians living in Japan, right? but uh, that family happened to be Christian, so they were kind of looking forward to hear something from that uh, young boy from Germany, from the country of Luther, maybe about Protestant religion or things like that, while I was looking forward to hear something about Zen Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever find that it was really hard for you in the early days when you first became a monk? I had been a vegetarian all my life. Oh, really? Already as a kid, I never liked to kind of chew on meat or, or fish. So I was surprised that on the night uh, of my ordination, the monks had uh, made a big party for me and that made beef steaks. When I said that I don't want to eat uh, meat, the monks told me, well, making preferences like that, that's uh, what we call killing. Really? And somebody donated that meat. If you refuse this donation, you are killing the good attention of the person that's donating. Uh, I, I see they're using the word kill in that sense. Exactly. Huh. And what I learned, or I had to learn first at Antaisha to become more flexible and more softer in that respect. And once you actually came to Antaisha, did things go pretty smoothly? Well, actually, I was thinking of leaving almost every day, maybe during the first uh, two years, because uh, I was prepared for lots of the Zen. I did the Zen already in Germany, so I was used to long hours of the Zen, or for an anti we sit for especially long hours. Mm. But that wasn't the main problem for me. It was harder to get used to the hard uh, physical work. Mm. And so I thought that the Zen is more important than the work. And um, by the feeling oh. that all my energy went into the work, so I didn't have anything left over for the Zen. So that's also what made me think, well, is this really what I've opted for? Was there anything that kind of took you beyond all of that and into a deeper appreciation of what you were doing? Five-day session, you ask yourself, well, what did I do here these five days? Mm. I was kind of in pain. Mm. So during one of these sessions, I told myself, well, either I stay here and I die on the cushion if it's necessary, or I leave completely. And in that moment where I made the decision I'm going to die, I realized it's actually very easy because I don't have to fight. I always thought I have to fight myself through. I have to bite my teeth together and fight myself through. But in that moment where I let go and say, and even it costs my life, I'm going to die here on the cushion, I was really relaxed in that moment hmm. because I'd given up already in a way. But I didn't switch my posture. I gave up in the posture. And then I realized huh. the Zen is doing the Zen for me. I don't have to do the Zen. So it's taking you out of the equation. Exactly. And that made everything easier. After eight years of training, Muho became a full-fledged Zen Buddhist priest. In 2001, he went to the city of Osaka and began living in a park there. Muho decided to hold Zazen sessions in the park to teach busy city dwellers the way of Zen. Six months later, his mentor, the head priest at Antaiji, died in an accident. If no one succeeded the head priest, 
the temple would cease to be a place of training. Nuhor decided to return to Amtaiji and become head priest himself. After this, you leave Antaiji one time and you go yes. to Osaka and yes. you, you live a homeless life. Yes. Originally, I thought I would go back to Germany and start a Zen group in Germany. Mm. But actually, there's quite a number of Zen groups already in Germany. And in Japan, there's close to 20,000 Zen temples. But only a very small fraction of those offers uh, the Zen for the public. So <laughs> yes. I thought I'll do it in a big city like Tokyo or Osaka. But rents are expensive in Japan, so I was thinking, where do I get the money from to pay for a place? Huh. And then when I walked through Osaka Castle Park, I realized there's lots of people living there in tents. Mm. And I thought, well, actually that's what Shakyamuni Buddha did 2,500 years ago. He left the palace to live in a park and meditate under a tree. Hmm. Uh, I can learn from these so-called homeless people and in a way I'm following at the same time the path of the Buddha. Would you sometimes think back to when your teacher was still around and this, what he would have said or maybe what he did say to you in the past? Yes, certainly. And you create Antaji. Huh. That impressed me a lot. You create Antaji. It's up to you what you can see here, what you can learn here. Mm. And my teacher told me, or my seniors told me, um, a lot of times, you don't count at all. And at first I thought, well, that's a contradiction. First they tell me I create untidy, how can they tell me now that I don't count at all? Uh -huh. And it took some time for me to realize that actually these two have to go together. Should you assert yourself or deny yourself? This question is discussed constantly at Antaiji. Two people are trying to decide who will clean where. One says that we should do this and the other person disagrees. The one is saying, this is what we always do at Antaiji. The other is saying, but this way is more efficient. So, if you ask me who is saying, I create Antaiji and really practicing it, they both are. But both proposals have good points and bad points. What would you do? I have no choice but to be selfish. Be selfish? Yes, state my opinion. Do what I think is right, what I think is best for everybody. Then wouldn't you clash with the others? Yes, I would. Mm, you need to decide what your priority is at that time and in that situation. Sometimes you may be lacking the resolve to create Antaiji, and sometimes you may be lacking in the ability to forget yourself and get along with others. You should not be too passive or too aggressive and self-centered. I know it's very difficult. I may tell you something different each time. So, you may be thinking, the head priest is contradicting himself. Sometimes I say, you don't count. And sometimes I say, this is about you, 
So why aren't you taking the initiative? And when you start taking the initiative, you are told, why are you pushing ahead on your own without consulting anyone else? You did say that to me. Do you find yourself now being in a position where you can feed that information to the people who come here anew uh, in a way that's easier for them to get to grips with without having to go through all the pain that you had? At least that's what I'm trying. For example, I used the story of one of my uh, Dharma brothers who used to uh, work in a sushi restaurant before he came here. And in the sushi restaurant, they have uh, also training that's supposed to prepare you for the job. But what they let you do is they let you clean the dishes uh -huh. and nothing else for mm -hmm. weeks and months. Mm -hmm. And then one day, they tell you today you're responsible for the sushi. You do the sushi today. And there's no teaching done. But you can't then stand there and say, well, please first teach me. Because then they ask, well, what have you done all these weeks? Where were you? So they... Um, of course, they demand that you clean the dishes properly, but at the same time, you use your eyes and ears and see what is going on here. First, you discover what is there, but only you can do that uh -huh. using your five senses. Uh -huh. So has it been a positive um, experience for you having students here at the temple? Yes, certainly. Um, but also for me, it's not an easy thing. They stay for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, but then they're gone again and I have to continue to explain the same things over uh, and over again. Please uh -huh. switch off the light after you use the toilet. Please arrange your slippers. And I find myself kind of complaining. Why do I have only stupid students coming here? And then I have to remind myself that, well, who's responsible for these students coming here? And who's responsible for training them? It's me. Mm. So, in a way, they are my reflection. Um, if I want more these students to be more serious, if, they want, if I want them to change their attitude, well, I'm the person who can show them an example. And if they don't learn, then probably the example is not the right thing. Mm. So, in a way, I could say the students are a mirror for me, or actually that now, as my master has died, the students are my master. I learned from my students. Muho's family lives on the temple grounds. He married nine years ago and is the father of two children aged seven and eight. Muho spends most of his time with the Zen students. Time with the family is precious. We had a whole week off school. So, you did all your homework? Yes, I did. Okay. What's 100 times 5? Let's see. 100 times 5. 100 times 5 is 500. Muho says he learns a lot from spending time with his children. Antaiji is self-sufficient, but it's certainly not isolated from society. Today, the head priest of a temple at the foot of the mountain is visiting Antaiji with his followers. So it's all right if I come here to pray? Of course, any time. <laughs> the visitors give them seed rice and lend them a threshing machine. Life at Antaiji is supported by the local community. So you are self-sufficient here? Yes, we make our rice and vegetables, but we buy things like oil, salt and sugar. The rice this year was excellent. I would say it's the best rice in years. In the nine years since Muho became head priest, ties with the community have grown ever stronger. I suppose it's a give and take relationship with, yes. with the community. Um, what I notice is that many people living down in the village are leaving their village 
to move to more convenient areas. Ah. And I hope that Antaj in a way demonstrates that it's possible to live here and to actually enjoy life here and that even as a foreigner you can pick up uh, planting rice paddies and farming rice and that in a way it encourages people to stay in rural areas or maybe to actually live, uh, move out of the city and uh, rediscover the, the beauty and the worth of living this kind of life where you are self-sufficient, where you feel where the life comes from, where mm. the food comes from that you're eating. What is Japan to you? Mm. Um, one answer I would like to give to that, there's uh, two Chinese characters. In Japanese it's written Deko and Boko. One of them <laughs> yeah. is a sign that has a protruding form. Uh -huh. Uh, like like a square with a protrusion that's deco it's like a lego piece exactly and then the boko which is also a square but it has this intrusion uh -huh. and for me the japanese mentality in a way is like this boko um we westerners the, we kind of start with this me i'm me i'm me and you are you and then we might have a relation while for the Japanese, it's more like we're already connected. There's this connection and this part here, which in the West is almost invisible. The, the receptor. Yeah, th that, that, that's what's important in Japan. They have this expression, kuki or yomu, to read the air, mm. to read this in-between, this connection. Uh -huh. The Western people, they communicate Western style. They're shouting and they're wondering, why do I never get a response from the Japanese side? While the Japanese, they're saying, well, I've been digging this well here for weeks and months, and why is he never starting to dig? Well, why? <laughs> so both sides are kind of dissatisfied with each other's kind of communication skills. And you are the kind of adhesive in the middle? Yes, in a way. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been extremely interesting. Thank you for coming.